I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Tacey M. Atsidi Diné Navajo is a Sleep Rock people and born for Tangle people. She was born in Logan, Utah, grew up in Kirtland, New Mexico, but is originally from Cove, Arizona. She holds bachelor's degrees from Brigham Young University and the Institute of American Indian Arts and an MFA in creative writing from Cornell. Tacey Atsidi is a recipient of the Truman Capote Creative Writing Fellowship, the Corson Branding Poetry Prize, Morning Star Creative Writing Award, and the Philip Frund Prize. Her work has appeared or was forthcoming in Poetry, Epoch, Kenyon Review Online, Prairie Schooner, Crazy Horse, New Poets of Native Nations, and other pub publications. Her newest book is Rain Scald, which came out a couple of years ago. Please go get that. Jackie Oshiro has lived in Salt Lake City and taught at the University of Utah, where she's currently Distinguished Professor of English for 30 years. She received her BA from Harvard in 1978 and her PhD in English and American Literature and Language from Princeton. She's the author of eight con excuse me, collections of poetry, Looking for Angels in New York, Conversations with Survivors, With the Moon in Transit, Dead Men's Praise, The Hoopoe's Crown, White Thorn, Ultimatum from Paradise, Is, um, and My Lookalike at the Krishna Temple. Um, she has received grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, the Ingram Merrill Foundation, and the Witter Binner Prize from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, as well as a number of prizes from the Poetry Society of America. Michael Souter is a poet, scholar, essayist, former Buddhist, and longtime yoga practitioner. He writes about wilderness, landscape, fatherhood, yoga, and spirituality. He's a professor of English at Utah State University, where he teaches poetry writing, and an affiliated faculty member of yoga and religious studies, where he teaches the history and philosophy of yoga. He's the author of House Under Moon, Whitman's Ecstatic Union, Conversion and Ideology in Leaves of Grass, The Empty Boat, Cafe Midnight, a calendar of crows. Born and raised in Utah, Darlene Young currently lives in South Jordan with her husband and sons. She teaches creative writing and literature of the LDS people at Brigham Young University and Brigham Young University Salt Lake. She writes poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction. Her poetry collection, Homespun and Angel Feathers, was published by BCC Press in 2019, and her poetry has been anthologized in Fire in the Pasture, 21st Century Mormon Poets, Moth and Rust, the Best of Mormonism, The Mother and Me, and other collections. Her YA novel, Inside Out, won second place in the Utah Arts Council contest. So welcome to everyone. Thank you all for coming. So we have questions that were already sent to us before we even began, and we're gonna hit some of those. I'm gonna, um, and they're, they're really great questions, and they're also kind of difficult, but I wanna start with a sort of open and broad question, and we'll start with Tacey because we're gonna go alphabetically. So what to you is a devotional poem? What, what are the hallmarks? What are the tropes? Uh, you know, what does it do? How do we know we're in the devotional? Yeah, I think um, for me, you know, like you, you mentioned, there are, you know, certain tropes. Um, but, but I think for me personally, at least as I, when I approach devotional poetry in, in my own writing. Um, I feel like if it's anything that is um, speaking to the divine, speaking to deity, um, any sort of, uh, I guess, holy utterance in that way. Um, yeah, so that those are my initial thoughts. And I want to make sure I leave room for everyone else to say something. What about other people? I guess I'm next alphabetically. I agree with you. I think speaking to the divine is a great uh, definition of devotional poetry. And therefore, I think I don't really write it because I very, very rarely <laughs> address the divine. However, um, I, I'm really, really uh, interested in divine language, especially the Hebrew Bible. And so I guess that's why I get included on these panels because I, I'm often engaging the language of the Hebrew Bible, um, which I guess also gets called the Old Testament, right? And um, so it, if we open it out, devotional poetry might be poetry that profoundly engages the kind of language and issues that devotional people engage. Even but, if you yourself don't believe, is that what you're yeah, also suggesting? That's what I'm saying, yeah. I mean, 
you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too devoted. I'm afraid. <laughs> I remember a joke you told me many years ago. I said something about, well, you're, you're classified in so many places as a Jewish poet. And, and, you know, the assumption is that you, you know, you would be religious and you said, Oh, Jews don't believe in God. <laughs> I can actually, you know, there's actually such a funny, there was such a funny thing. This must be the thing that I told you, which was, it was an obituary of a, you know, a, a, a labor organizer in Israel or something. And they told the story about how he was a communist in Eastern Europe in ancient days, you know, before the revolution. And he found the woman he wanted to marry, went to her father and said, you know, I want to marry your daughter. And he said, well, do you observe the Sabbath? And the guy said, observe the Sabbath. I'm not communist. I don't believe in God. And the guy said, who asked you? <laughs> I didn't ask you if you believed in God. I asked you if you observed that. And this is the kind of Judaism that I practice. Because I, I mean, I even eat kosher. I do all kinds of insane things, none of which have to do with belief but they have to do with kind of culture and tradition. So that's where I'm coming from. Michael. Uh, thank you. And thank you guys. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, I'm really excited to be here and grateful. So uh, I was thinking about this question beforehand and you know, I was thinking that, that for me, devotional poetry is uh, kind of like what Tacey said, you know, it's poetry that moves us toward kind of a sense of reverence, a sense of awe, uh, maybe, maybe even like a sense of stillness. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's either, it's maybe a gaze upward or a gaze inward. And, uh, you know, kind of toward a place where the discursive mind can kind of quiet down a little bit um, into a place where, you know, we become aware of a sense of sacred presence and mystery that's always there, but, you know, our discursive mind is always so busy that it often occludes it. So I guess that's kind of the way I think about it. And I'm going to come back to you at some point because I do want to talk about your study on Walt Whitman because, you know, the interesting ways in which the spiritual, uh, the divine kind of works in, in that. Darlene, what about you? How, how do you define a devotional poem or how do you see it? I think there are, there are basically two sorts of devotional uh, modes, I guess. One is just the expression of religious feeling. It's just um, an, an enacting or an expressing by the speaker um, about their yearning towards something spiritual, God or something else spiritual. But the other I think is um, a kind of poem, maybe more like what you were talking about, Michael, that could sort of invite the reader into an experience that would maybe be producing or aiding in some kind of an experience that the reader is trying to have. Um, I think those are two maybe different things. For me, I like to, most of mine is expressive, but I find both very interesting. Well, this leads to another kind of question, which is, does one need to be part of a faith or to speak specifically to a faith to be writing in a devotional vein? And it sounds like, you know, no, generally speaking, but that does that, you know, what does that do in terms of audience recognition? You know, do, would, we, does an eco poem that speaks reverentially in, in, in this kind of language, does that get put into the devotional tradition or does that bit get put somewhere else? I'm just kind of curious, anyone who wants to take that one. Well, I, uh, I was thinking about this as well. And, you know, Mary Oliver is, is a kind of good example of this. You know, um, I know in, in her poem, A Summer Day, where she says, you know, I don't know exactly what prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention. Hmm. how to fall into the grass and kneel in the grass. And so I do think there's, you know, it's something about a sense of reverence, even if there's not a specific uh, spiritual or religious tradition. I saw the film Nomadland last night. Uh -huh. And to me, that's a very devotional film. There's nothing about God or religion in it whatsoever, but it just has such a beautiful sense of reverence for the landscape and the people. And uh, so uh, to me, that's like a devotional film. So, yeah. Can one write a poem that is devotional that does not contain reverence? I, I, I'm just kind of curious, like does, does, does the devotional require in some sense a kind of awe, a, an awareness of a kind of sublime? Jackie, you, you're like, ah. You well, guys I'm just thinking immediately of say Paul Salon, a truly great poet. Right. And in that poem, oh one, oh, 
oh no one, wait, oh one, oh none, oh no one, oh you, where does the way lead when it leads nowhere? And you know, he doesn't have reverence, but mm -hmm. he understands what reverence is in order to write a sort of anti-reverent poem mm -hmm. uh, after his horrific experiences. And I think, I think that's definitely a devotional poem. I mean, I would include that in devotional poetry. Yeah. Sort of like Hopkins, Hopkins' terrible sonnets. Yeah. You know, no, he's, like right, anti. exactly. No, I'll not carry it. It's true. Exactly. You, I, I think you have to understand what reverence is to write a devotional poem, but the poem itself might be profoundly irreverent. Mm -hmm. I would think that um, the thing that ties them together is not necessarily reverence, but maybe a sense of reaching, mm. a sense of longing or reaching for something. And it could be out of anger or frustration or awe or something else. I like what you said there, that just it's a sense of reaching and, and disappointment in its own strange way is a sense of reaching where it's like, you know, when we think about, you know, Christ on the cross, like why, why have, have, why have you forsaken me? That that question of um, reaching towards an answer, reaching towards something too, that there's something um, in there. I'm, I'm curious about you, Tacey. Do you think that there's something about the irreverence or, you know, writing maybe not irreverently, but against a kind of reverence in other respects that, that can qualify a poem as devotional? Yeah, I, I'll just kind of back up what Darlene just said in terms of, um, you know, when I when I think about um, utterance to to the divine or to um, holy people, you know, it, it doesn't have to have reverence, right? Like we could be grieving, we could be angry, we could be, you know, confused, frustrated, and all of those, you know, um, if we're being holy ourselves with a father, you know, expressing the way that we are feeling doesn't necessarily. Um, I mean, I don't know. I feel like to a small, like even in the smallest degree, there there is some reverence. But at the same time, like if we're being truthful and if we're being honest in those, you know, in those words, then it we can still be that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, a kind of radical honesty. This sort of goes right to this question that um, Chris Kokinos, hey Chris, um, has uh, thrown into the question, which is a great one. How does devotional work change in the aftermath of disappointment with the thing, God, culture, et cetera, to, to which one is devoted? Um, and that's, you know, we started talking about Hopkins a little bit there too, right? Those, um, and John Donne's paradoxical holy sonnets. Right. And we might even want to think about the role that paradox even plays in the devotional mode. But I'm curious, you know, anyone who wants to take this, you know, how does devotional work change in, in the aftermath of grief or disappointment for you? I guess, um, I mean, one thing that comes to my mind <clears throat> is that, I mean, if, if it's in a kind of religious tradition uh, where you have a metaphysics, you know, then you can be like Job, you can be complaining, you, you know, like or the bhakti traditions of India, you can be weeping because God has left you or, you know, the Christian mystics the same way. Mm -hmm. So if it's in a metaphysical tradition, I mean, I guess it can be anything. Um, but if it's outside a kind of religious metaphysical tradition, then it's a little harder to define a devotional poetry if you don't have reverence or awe or, you know, something like that. But I do think that that whole issue of like disappointment uh, is, is part of it. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, when the letters of Mother Teresa came out, you know, and we realized how estranged she felt from God her whole life, you know, when she was portrayed as someone who's in communion with God all the time, you know, so I do think that that is part of it. Mm. I think that, um, I mean, I'm a person of faith, and for me, the definition of faith is the actions that you take in spite of or in the presence of doubt. And so I think when you're writing from a place of disappointment, you're still writing potentially from a place of faith, that the ant antithesis of that would be apathy. So the fact that you're still producing something and still engaging with the topic, it, to me, that's still devotional, mm -hmm. still this for faith. Right, and again, the example was brought up of Hopkins. 
And if you think, say, the last line of, uh, you know, thou art indeed just, O Lord, right? Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. I mean, it's really fantastic line of poetry. And it comes from really feeling like you got nothing. Yeah. And you got nothing coming in. But you still go to God for it. Right? Yeah. So, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and I mean, some of the greatest, you know, conversions and breakthroughs and uh, transformations have happened through suffering, you know, mm -hmm. through disappointment. And I think that's, you know, just like in AA, an alcoholic has to hit bottom before they turn around, you know? So I think that's part of the path. But what's interesting is that also, this is where we start to separate, um, going back to the two modes, I think that, that Darlene was suggesting, you know, to, to imagine devotional literature is like, you know, if you're, if you're like me, a secular humanist on a good day, then, <laughs> you know, then disappointment isn't going to put me into that, 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 rig that place of, you know, why have you forsaken me? Why, you know, when will this come? When will some sort of answer be there or, or to feel or be to be, able to be able to express that sense of betrayal? So some devotional poetry does absolutely require then faith, right? A, me a metaphysics, as you were pointing out there, Michael. Um, I'm just going to go to the next question because the, this is a good one too. I just finished a grad poetry workshop with Kim Johnson and she said that one thing that makes a devotional poem successful is the resistance tying things up neatly, to be willing to leave the difficult questions unanswered, to wander around and question without needing to fix and understand because life does not have all of the answers. Do you agree or disagree? I'm going to start with you, Tacey. I'm, do you agree or disagree? And if you want to see the, the uh, question, it's actually in the Q&A too, because it's a long one. Okay, yeah, let's take a look again. Um, yeah, I think I definitely agree. I think it's nice to feel like, you know, you walk away from an experience or you walk away from a poem having um, processed through it all and feel like, you know, okay, well, I've got this and, you know, God has my back and we're good. <laughs> But um, it, it's not always like that. And I think that process is, is a big part of it in terms of um, faith, right? Faith growing and faith building. And that, that is, it takes a lifetime, you know? And so to wrap things up nicely, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, but at the same time, I keep thinking, well, I've had experiences where my faith has been tried and I've, you know, process through certain smaller events, could I write a poem that just encapsulates that small event and kind of tie it up nicely? Maybe, yeah. But I know that that's not going to be the end, right? Like I know it's it's going to continue onward. I also wonder, I mean, the question of aesthetics comes into play around this too. Like, do we, are we less likely to admire the poems or respond to the poems that do tie things up too neatly. Like, so for instance, when we're thinking about, I mean, I can't come up with a poet off the top of my head, but I'm sure like, like a Hallmark greeting card sometimes will have, <laughs> you know, a certain kind of nice bow wrapped around certain things. And maybe some of those would be considered, um, depending on the context, uh, devotional poems too, but we wouldn't necessarily be responding to them. So how much of the idea of a good poem, uh, a good devotional poem relies on ambiguity. Oh, well, yeah, Jackie. No, I would just say that that's the, the whole interest. And I think the reason why religious issues have been the source of so much fabulous poetry. And again, I'll start with the Hebrew Bible, maybe out of ignorance of what preceded it. But do you know, I mean, I think because we don't really know what we're talking about. We have to talk about something that we don't know, we suspect, uh, you know, and I do think that, you know, poems work much more by suggestion and suspicion, uh, you know, than anything else. And so tying things up really just isn't poetry's best mode, it seems to me. It's opening up possibility, seeing where you might go, suggesting possible spots to follow, but certainly not saying, here's my answer. And I think it's pretty hard to have an answer in a realm that's so utterly unknowable as 
as, as the realm of the divine. So that's yeah. why, you know, so I would say, yeah, that's why it works so well in poetry and always has. I, I'd just like to mention that uh, Benjamin Blackhurst in the chat uh, just uh, shared a quotation from Simone Weil, the mysteries of faith are degraded if they are made into an object of affirmation and negation, when in reality they should be an object of contemplation. So I think that's brilliant, you know, that, uh, yeah, that like the whole, the whole, all of our life is bound up in this, you know, and all of our suffering and all of our hope and, you know, it's all there. So, yeah, there's nothing really to be tied up. It's ongoing. Right. Yeah, I really appreciate what Jackie said. Um, I was thinking about Dickinson saying that she dwells in possibility. And, uh, you know, the, the, the wind is, poetry is for more numerous windows, the opening up. Um, but also, I think it's an aspect of all good art that there is some kind of tension. So if what you have is a poem with no tension at all, it's probably not going to be a great piece of art. It might be helpful to someone in some way, but I wouldn't call it a great poem. There has to be something. If it's not tension between the person and their God, it might be the tension between a person and her own self as she tries to encounter something, but mm -hmm. there needs to be some kind of tension going on in order for it to be art, in my opinion. And, and so much of the spiritual path, you know, is about continually dying and being reborn and being transformed. And so this tension and this drama is just inherent in there all the time. And since you brought up Dickinson, um, a favorite of mine, you know, and you wanna talk about having two things, opposite things simultaneous, that's her genius. But a great example in a devotional poem, right, is the one that begins at least to pray is left, is left, oh Jesus in the air. I know not where thy chamber is. I'm knocking everywhere. And she goes on, thou settest mal maelstrom in the south, no, so, no, thou settest earthquake in the south and maelstrom in the sea. Say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, hast thou no arm for me? And what's so fabulous about that, hast thou no arm for me, meaning an arm of comfort, but also an arm, an armament, so I can fight you, you jerk who puts maelstroms and, and earthquakes everywhere. So I mean, simultaneously, right? She's asking for God's comfort and, and asking for protection and you know some some weapon against God. So that's a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about. It seems to me. And I just can't help but think of you know John Donne again, right? You know, batter my heart, three person God, where he's simultaneously saying, you know, I I am the city that I I long to admit you, and yet I long to defend myself against you, and uses this language of of, of rape and violation at the same time, you know, like. And that, that ending paradox, you know, I never chased except you ravish me. That, that sense of like, this can't actually occur unless this, this terrible sort of um, violation also potentially occurs, right? Like I, my borders are pierced. So going, the Q&A is like blowing up here. I love this. Mm -hmm. So Maddie has um, asked a great question along this line, and, and it speaks to another question that somebody prior to this panel had sent in a question about metaphor itself. When writing or reading devotional verse, do you take a different approach to metaphor and embodiment and their respective implications? Does that relationship require a certain reverence or understanding of reverence some of you spoke about earlier? So again, that's in the Q&A, you can click on that. That's a complex question. So when writing or reading devotional verse, do you take a different approach to metaphor and embodiment? Are we in uh, a place? Well, something comes to mind to me. Um, you know, that uh, what I love about metaphor is that metaphor is saying something is that and mm -hmm. it's not that, you know, so it's saying, you know, my love is a red, red rose, right, but it's also not. And so to me, I mean, just like all our conceptions and words and names for the divine are just metaphors for something that's greater, something that's bigger, a mystery that's bigger. And, uh, and anyway, and I love, I just love the comment about embodiment because you know, there's so many mystical traditions, both, you know, the, the Christian mystics and also the Bhakti poets of India, where it's a kind of divine romance, you know, and it's very much talking about often in sexual terms, you know, that this union that I crave is for this, this you know, annihilation in this ecstatic embrace. And so embodiment, I think, is central. You know, it's the word made flesh, right? So. 
I'm thinking about some of the Christian mystics from the 12th century, and in, in, especially around the in in Germany, those are the German territories, and the sexual language they often used, um, the union with Christ, and they 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 took that as both figurative and literal, the bridegroom of Christ, but then also the ways in which Christ's own body became. Um, depicted in very different ways that Christ would grow breasts or, you know, bleed milk from his wounds as, you know, becoming this um, figure that was male and female. So it's a really fascinating thing. But I'm curious, um, Tacey, when you find yourself writing a poem that is, you would, you would think of as devotional, do you find yourself turning to, to specific metaphors or ways of thinking of embodiment? Do you find yourself turning to particular poetic devices even? Yeah, I, I feel like um, form, I think for me, is, is one, of, um, one of the things that I turn to and repetition, um, refrain, refrain, is um, kind of Im embedded in who, who I am as Dine, um, as Navajo. I think the earliest forms of poetry for us are chant. Um, in ceremony and so singing and song is ceremony um, and so when I when I think about that I think about the repetition right the refrain and so for me that's something that um, when I consciously am composing something that I feel like is devotional that's what I go to yeah what about you, Darlene? And, and Jackie, you're also, you know, renowned as a formalist too. I mean, do you find that there are certain forms that you're going to be moving to or certain devices? I think there's two questions that have come up before about are there particular kinds of poetic devices that just really speak to the slant rhyme and after we talked about an after with Tacey's poetry, but other things. You want to go first, Darlene? You go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I love form. And I think the reason I love form is because it, it can, you know, you create this sort of container that you then fight against. It creates expectations that you can surprise against. And I think, I, again, here's this thing that we don't know, we can't figure out. It's uncontainable. And so to have this, this sort of uh, explosion between a container or would be container and the uncontainable, can be fabulous. And again, using the, your example, that fabulous 14th Holy Sonnet, mm -hmm. you know, here it is in this perfect form and it just goes in this extraordinary place. You know, so I think form works really, really well as an attempt to get at what can't be gotten at, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, but, but I think, you know, there are, I also write poems along these lines that are, you know, in free verse, I think it really just depends where you're headed and what you're trying to talk about. For me, I just, I just like to prioritize image over everything. And I, if it's a devotional poem, especially I want to get as gritty or mundane or earthy as I can in my images to, to be in tension with anything that I'm reaching for outside of earthly experience. I want to point to something in the chat and it uh, speaks to some of the other questions that I've been getting too. The examples here are so Western and so modern, um, you know, depending on how far back we want to think about modern. And, and I, 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 I feel the snark there, Matthew, just a little bit, but I, I think it's a great point to bring up. I mean, this is an ancient um, question about the devotional and certainly not located in one particular tradition. So I, like, can we start talking about and teasing out some of the differences and de different devotional practices? So Michael, I know, yeah, this is all you, Michael. Yeah, oh, thank you. I, I love that. Uh, yeah, so um, gosh, I don't know where to start. One thing I've noticed in studying, you know, the, the six main uh, predominant religions of the world is that, you know, the Sufis of Islam and the Bhakti poets of India uh, and the Christian mystical poets, they all have this kind of romance, this divine romance, where they feel this, you know, yearning for the divine. It's a love relationship. They're, you know, full of tears and weeping. And, uh, you know, this goes back to the Bhakti movement in India, which started around probably the sixth century and really has become the dominant form of spirituality in India. Um, whereas like the Buddhist tradition, you know, is not really so centered in devotion and centered in uh, like this yearning heart. 
Uh, for example, like Kabir, you know, the great 15th century poet from Varanasi, he says, in this poem, he says, it's the longing that does all the work. Mm -hmm. I just love that. He says, it's the longing that does all the work. And it's like St. Teresa of Avila, you know, she says, tears achieve everything on this path. Tears achieve everything. So, you know, this tremendous longing, I think, is at the heart of much devotional poetry. And yeah, it's an ancient tradition in India. Um, I could go on for hours, but I'll let other people talk too, so yeah. Well, can I ask, can we talk a little bit about the Buddhist tradition? Because of course that fractures out in so many different ways. And I know you are, you know, you are a former Buddhist and which, which form of Buddhism did you follow and why did you leave, if you don't mind? Yeah. Well, great question, kind of personal question. So, you know, when I was at 19, I got initiated into a tantric yoga tradition, which is very devotional, very full of bhakti. And, uh, and then I had a kind of spiritual crisis, which I could, you know, go into sometime. And then I became a Buddhist for about 15 years. I practiced pretty much in the Theravadan tradition, which is very kind of like simple, you know, you meditate, you focus on your breath, um, and it's very kind of stripped down in that way. But like you're saying, there are different traditions and the, the uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, which is, uh, you know, Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lama's uh, Buddhism, that is Tantric. And Tantric is very devotional. And so there is in the Dalai Lama's tradition, Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana, very much a sense of devotion for one's guru or yeah. one's lama. Um, there's no sense of a deity in Buddhism, you know, but there is devotion toward one's teacher and one's guru, who one sees as kind of an embodiment of the ultimate, which, you know, which Buddhism doesn't want to name. Buddhism doesn't want to name what the ultimate reality is, because then it creates like an idol in your head that you worship. So we're not going to give it a name. We're just going to call it emptiness. You know, mm -hmm. so there is a kind of a, a devotional strain in uh, Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, but it's just central in the Indian Hindu Bhakti traditions. And since we're asking personal questions, I would like to, if you don't mind, Tacey, I'd like to ask you a question about um, being sort of from two very potentially different cultural traditions and, you know, you're a bridge between both of them. And I'm curious about what you see as maybe some similarities and differences between maybe uh, a Navajo um, spiritual religious practice and a Mormon spiritual religious practice. Where might they be have, have some very interesting you know, things in common and where do they pull apart in really interesting ways for you? Yeah, so for me, one of the things that I really enjoy about both, um, both of who I am or parts of who I am um, is that within Diné culture and also within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, doctrine is that religion itself is integrated into everything, right? Into every thought, into every uh, word I speak, into everything that I do. And so that, that's the same with Diné, right? Everything is interconnected. We call it eh. Um, Lakotas, they call it Mintakio Yasin, right? All of my relations, everything is related. So even when we're speaking about, um, you know, eco poetics, I, and, and, you know, we're talking about Buddhism um, and Chinese poetry, I, I think a lot about the land. And I mean, I write a lot about the land, and I feel like it's because it's, it's all interconnected, right? And so for me, um, as Diné and as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, who I am is, is embedded in every thought and everything that I do and say it's not just, you know, it's not just on Sundays, right? Or it's not just at Easter, it's not just whenever, it's, it's in everything that I do and everything that I say in, in every waking moment. And um, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about and I'll say the religion, even though I like calling it the religion because it's 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 all encapsulated in, in who I am. Um, and I mean, I think in terms of your question, Paisley, um, moments where they kind of veer apart. Um, that I I, can, I think I could go on for a really long time about that, but I'll just yeah I'll just comment on that where um, similarities and where some of those things that I appreciate from um, from both of the cultures. 
one quick follow-up question though for you was you know based on what you said would you then see all of your poetry as then devotional if, if every you know everything every thought every part of your life is part of this you know is there a false distinction these poems are devotional and these poems are not for you yeah i i mean i would definitely say that you know um i was interviewed i can't remember by who or how long ago but um, one of the questions that someone asked me in the interview was, well, what's a question that you never get asked or something? And I thought, well, I, I think it's interesting that like I'm, you know, um, a very devoted member of my faith and nobody ever asks me about that <laughs> with my poetry. It's only because they see, you know, physically that I'm Navajo um, and that I do write about land and things like that. But, but yeah, I would say that all of my poetry, right, is, um, devotional poetry. This asks a really fascinating question or raises a fascinating question, I think, again, that we sort of started the hour with, and I want to turn to you, Jackie, because the ways in which maybe um, as readers are the ways that we end up having to promote our work or describe our work, right, maybe sometimes doesn't do our work the best service. And I'm curious, like, you know, you said, I keep getting put on these panels of devotional poetry, but I would not necessarily say this. And I'm kind of curious then, like, how does this, um, you know, how do you feel about the reputation of being a devotional poet if you yourself would say, maybe I'm not part of this tradition? Well, I don't really think I have any kind of reputation as a devotional poet. I have to say, I, that would really surprise <laughs> me. I definitely think people always throw me in the Jewish poetry camp. And all I have to say there is, I was on a panel a while ago in New York, some Jewish American poetry panel, and there were some young people, some older people. My kids live in New York, so at least some of them were in the audience. Anyway, one of the younger poets said, well, and this, is, this goes to what you just said, Tacey, in a way. One of the younger poets said, well, some of my poems are Jewish poems, and some of my poems aren't. And I <laughs> leaned over to the guy sitting next to me, and I said, if I write it, it's a Jewish poem. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? That, that's where I'm coming from. You know, you know, history, culturally, whatever you want to call it. So that I very much am. You know, that's, that's what I am. I come from this tradition, this way of looking at the world, particularly the Eastern European one, that kind of sense of humor, that sense of irreverence toward God, you know, all those things. I mean, that's very much what, where I'm coming from. So I'm perfectly happy to be called the Jewish American poet because that's what I am. You know what I mean? I don't like being called a formalist because I'm not. I don't think form has any, has any, it has no preference for me. I always describe myself as an opportunist. Whatever I think is gonna work for me, that's what I'm gonna try. And I do love form, so I resort to it on a lot of occasions. But you see what I mean? But yeah. no, a devotional poet, I just don't see myself that way. That, if somebody else sees me that way, it's okay with me, but it's not how I see myself. Darlene, I'd like to, um, and actually this is for everybody, but it might be particularly interesting for you, Darlene. So Catherine, um, Kate Coles asks a great question here, which is, and it goes back to this idea about doubt and ten tension, but when you're writing within a faith community where there is potentially pr pressure to affirm faith or to uh, perform a particular idea of that faith, how does, do, um, how do you find the space to introduce doubt and tension? And I, mean, I think this also speaks to a kind of issue around representation um, too, that we've been starting to talk about, which is if one is associated with, or you know, part of a faith tradition, and there might be ideas of how that faith is supposed to be representing itself. How do you, how do you write freely? How do you express the kinds of doubts and tensions that uh, will naturally arise? Well, I have to say, I don't feel any pressure to present myself in any particular way, but the, what I do feel pressure for myself is to tell the truth about my experience. And as I've said before, I believe that, um, it, that if I have a sure and undoubting knowledge of something, that isn't the place of faith. Faith is what happens when I doubt. So um, when I write poems of, out of a place of doubt, that's just telling the truth about my experience. I don't think that having doubts or questions 
um, prevents me from also being a faithful person. I mean, I, I feel like it's my job just to tell the truth of my experience as I experience it. And others reading it may find in the empathy that they feel, because it sounds like a familiar experience to them, it may end up being a faith promoting experience to read my work, but that's not my goal. I'm just trying to tell the truth as I see it, make art out of it, and hopefully if I do it well, someone else can access that experience. I'm going to ask two last questions, um, and then I'd love to turn to you guys to end with reading a poem of your choice by yourself or somebody else. But um, the first question is, are there particular aspects about poetry in general that perhaps make poems quite well suited for devotional or spiritual meditation? We talked a little bit about some of the formal issues that, you know, inform your own work, but do you, why poetry and, and devotional writing in general? Because I, I find that it almost always goes hand in hand. It's hard to find the devotional novel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess I would uh, just share that, uh, you know, so much of the contemplative traditions are about quieting the chattering mind. And, you know, when we read a poem, it slows our chattering mind down. You know, we get a little quieter. We go word by word a little more slowly. And, uh, and this is, you know, um, a central practice of meditation and contemplation, trying to get to a quieter space. And so there are long traditions of, you know, chanting in religious traditions and, you know, just ways to, to quiet our minds a little bit. And I think poems are really great in doing that because we do slow down. We maybe sit with an image for a little while and uh, we just get a, a, a chance to enter some stillness <clears throat> and just be present in that stillness, right? And see what we discover. So yeah, I think poems are great for that. Anyone else wanna? Yeah, I, you know, to your kind of joke, um, I was thinking, I don't know if anyone's read Leslie Silko's um, The Turquoise Ledge. It's a memoir. Um, and if any of you read it, you've found that she goes on for, you know, a couple hundred pages talking about walking around in the desert, looking and picking up rocks. And so, you know, I, I didn't read any reviews, but I could see how people, you know, it, it was hard. It was hard for my students to get through when I taught it. But, um, but I loved it because for that contemplative, you know, um, variable in it. And I, I think that it's, it's difficult to do that with prose. Right, because you know, like Michael was saying, there's you have an image, and then you know, as the reader, you can contemplate on it at your you know own time. And, but if you're trying to read prose for that length, I mean, it's it's very difficult. Um, so yeah, I just I think that the density of the poem helps a reader um, kind of. Yeah, I I don't know. I I was just I was just thinking it's it's a little bit more accessible or, I don't know, maybe just preferred. You know, it's funny, what you just said reminded me of James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. And there's a whole section where he just lists all the things that are in the house of these people he's staying in. And it's, you know, and it's this place where, you know, my students also just fall asleep too, but it is meant to be devotional. It's meant to be, you know, this kind of, reverential treatment of people and subjects and objects that would normally just get passed over. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's going back to something, I can't remember who was saying it before earlier in the panel, the idea of a paying a very close attention and, and, and witness to something that would normally not be witnessed. Darlene and Jackie, any ideas on this one? I feel like, oh, sorry, Jackie. <laughs> um, I, for me, writing poetry is a way of falling in love with the details of the world. That, um, and, and I think this makes poetry a metaphor for faith anyway, because the whole concept of finding the abstract through the specific or the, um, through the concrete. And, um, you know, Jesus said he came so that people might experience life more abundantly. And so when I write a poem about something, it's a way of getting a little extra out of an experience that I had, a little extra enjoyment out of the detail that I'm writing about. That's beautiful. Oh, that's great. Jackie? 
Yeah, no, I like what everybody said. And I, as I said before, I just think that poetry is a medium for getting at what can't be gotten at any other way. And, they, and you know, all these issues are very difficult to get at, so. One quick question for everybody. You know, are there any particular poets, any point in time in history, any faith um, that you find yourself responding to still? Um, any names, any recommendations, you know, poets that you feel like they, they get to, they speak to something deep for you about that seeking tradition? Well, I mentioned Kabir. Kabir is probably my favorite poet, uh, Indian poet of the 15th century. I completely love this book, Women in Praise of the Sacred by Jane Hirschfield. It's just a fantastic anthology of devotional poetry. Um, I'm really crazy right now about this uh, 13th century Kashmiri uh, tantric poet named uh, Ai Lala. She is just amazing. Just four line poems are really short, easy to teach but uh, just mind blowing. They're just fantastic. <laughs> That's a couple. Fantastic. Anyone else? I was just thinking, oh, go ahead, Jacqueline. <laughs> no, I'm just gonna say here's, here's, uh, here's Jay and Kim's uh, anthology. And I was looking at it briefly in preparation for today and they've really done a good job. And mm -hmm. but what I thought of when I was looking at the more contemporary poets is the most surprising people are in there. And it struck me that everybody, sooner or later, who's writing poems, gets into a devotional mode. I mean, <laughs> you, Paisley, the secular humanist on a good day. You're right. <laughs> I know, I'm in that anthology. And if you're interested in that anthology, it is in fact for sale at the virtual book fair. And yes, it is a so. fantastic, it's a great, great anthology. Um, to look at, to get a real broad sweep of devotional poetry. Tacey, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to mention Jane Hurstfield and um, Bridget Jean Kelly. Oh, um, yeah. Like oh, my gosh, yes. Such a good choice. Darlene, anyone for you? Um, you mentioned Hopkins and Dunn. They've been big for me. Also, Morris Manning's Bucolics was a yeah, big one for me. And there's another one, a collection of sonnets by Jean Marie Walker called Pilgrim, You Find the Path by Walking which has been really, um, uh, it's influenced me. Thank you so much. We're going to end, I would love it if we could just um, end, we began with poetry, if we could end with poetry. So we'll go back um, around, but alphabetically in reverse. So we'll start with Darlene. If you just want to read a poem, that would be fantastic. This is called Even Psalm. Smog today, but I saw your wink in the pink light of the peaks above it heard your chuckle in the plumes of trumpets and under the skin drums of the high school marching band practicing four blocks away. I felt you at church yesterday in the glittering silent air after the last notes of the organ solo, that silent tolling wind that unfurled in the curls of even old snoring Sister B, carbonating our blood so that even the teenagers glanced up from their phones, all of us clanging, goosebumped wrapped. Evening, I sense you, nappy and wild, dancing in the cat's yawn, the cut grass, and the moth's lantern drunk at the window screen. Holy jack-in-the-box, strewer of breadcrumbs, when I catch sight of your hem, for a time, I fear no evil. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Michael, then Jackie, and then Tacey. Okay, uh, I'm gonna read a poem from my book, House Under the Moon. Uh, it's called, <clears throat> When God Wakes Up Inside You. When God wakes up inside you, you'll lift your head like a sunflower in a field where the drops of dew have risen to the tips of every blade of grass. You'll be such a bead of iridescence, ready to be taken into the air. On the day that God turns to you those dark forest eyes, you'll find yourself in a theater watching an opera of your life, standing up and yelling, I thought it was a tragedy. I thought it was a tragedy. And when she comes from her bath, perfumed and newly robed, do you think you'll ever get that grin off your face? And when her robe falls to the floor, did I say hers? 
Did I mean his? O oh, dichosa ventura. The rest of the day, the rest of your life, you'll see those eyes everywhere, looking into the architectures of light. Then only dancing will make sense, breathing her breath, his, until you find yourself looking out the irises of every stranger's eyes. Okay, I'm going to read uh, Egrets in Beersheba, um, and it refers to this line from Isaiah, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And uh, someone really did tell me that she attended a, a translation conference at which someone talked about an African language, which they didn't have any words for snow and no one knew what it was. And that verse was translated. They didn't have a word, for, but for snow, but they said that purity is egret feathers. Mm. So though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as egret feathers is the way it's translated into that African language. Okay. Egrets in Beersheba. What language is it? in which egret feathers mean purity, in which my friend swears it, Isaiah's scarlet sins go white as egret feathers, not as snow. Isaiah could so easily have mentioned egrets. I saw them in Beersheba, crowding out the trees, each slender, graceful torso, white as snow. So many, I thought the trees would topple over. Though it was summer, they seemed to have no leaves, just slender, graceful arcs of blameless snow, which made, I have to admit, an absolute racket. But surely it was that ecstatic noise that got me for once to lift my eyes, the very sound Isaiah's voice was after. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as the egrets in these trees. But then he was afraid he divulged his secret. His immaculate source wasn't God at all, but fleet white arrows slashing the heavens, divvying the clouds among the startled trees, snow white feathers flying as they go. He crossed out egret and wrote snow. Mm. That's beautiful too. Tacy. Yeah, so I'm going to read, um, a poem also called Eventide, or sorry, Evensong. Um, and it's the three parts. I'm just gonna read the first part and um, here we go. Evensong one. At the throat of this tree, he sees me kneel, steep into leaves and pockets of shale. My voice hollows out veins and roots. I look to you to see you fallen mouth from the sky, up where lips round off over descant, steep into leaves and pockets of shale, open rain beaded blossom, uvular angles, where rocks fall out of themselves, utter up where lips round off over descant. I want to go back to Ruth, mouth ever so filled to the lips before the fall, word spill, where rocks fall out of themselves, utter a prayer, both limb and leaf bent skyward, the calm before collapse, creek cut at the lips before the fall, a word spill from leaf tongue, father, from cracks, the calm before collapse, creek cut, in the throat of this tree, he sees me kneel. My voice hollows out veins and roots. That was a wonderful reading from all of you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Darlene and Michael and Jackie and Tacey. This is a wonderful panel. Thank you all for coming. This is the last panel of the last day of the Utah Poetry Festival. Again, thank you to the Utah Humanities Council, uh, the Utah Arts and Museums, um, Academy American Poets and the Mellon Foundation for grants, 
a real special thank you to Kim Johnson and Lisa Bickmore and Jennifer Tong, who also did so much to make um, the planning of this, the conception of this uh, come together. Uh, it's just been a real pleasure working with all of you. And it's a pleasure seeing all of you guys out there, or at least imagining you. Um, hopefully you will still keep up with the festival by just following us on Facebook and Twitter to find out the next poem videos that appear, um, celebrate Utah poets and poetry. Have a great weekend. Thank you all again.